Penn State practice number two is in the books. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. That's Nate Bauer, senior editor of Blue White Illustrated. We were both at practice yesterday, seeing what you can uh, from the sidelines of Haluba Hall. We'll give you our impressions of the things we saw and heard today on the BWI Daily Edition. Also, because it's Thursday, get your mailbag questions in as well. And as always, if you want to get those questions in on the show, Nate, where is the best place to get your questions in? Uh, smoke signals. I don't, uh, do you think I know Morse code too? Like what? <laughs> Car- carrier pigeons. Uh, no, yes, no, that too. Twitter. I'll, t- I'll take the bait. Mm-hmm. Twitter mm-hmm. at T Frank Carr. Thomas Frank Carr. It's right down there below you on the screen. Oh, so close. Uh, or BWI. Penn State on three. I, I, you do it. You're better at this. You know, you know the locations. Well, if you want to get your questions in, Wednesday night is the time to do it. The best place, the most direct path is bluewhiteillustrated.com, where you sign up for just a dollar. You get access to the Lions Den message board, and you post your question on the BWI mailbag thread. It's I even use an exclamation point. I make it all big and fancy so that you can't miss it. comes out every Wednesday night, depending on the time, you know, because Penn State is practicing Wednesday nights, and we're going back and forth from Haluba Hall. It's usually a little later, so check out a little later. And then, of course, as Nate said, on Twitter, at Thomas Frank Carr, we'll have questions from both today, and I even threw in one that I got a text from a friend because it was a great question, and I want to uh, get to that question oh. as well. Because oh, wow. it, it was a very, uh, I thought it was a very provocative question that I think we can have a good discussion about. But great. first thing first, you posted your reactions, your thoughts about what went on over at Luba Hall yesterday already at bluewhiteillustrated.com. Sign up for just a dollar, get it for just a dollar, get it for just a dollar. Link is in the description of the video. Do it. But we'll yeah. discuss some of them here. So what are your first impressions of what you saw in week two? Yeah, you know, I, I think from a observations standpoint of like practice, I mean, I, I don't know, you could gauge it maybe a little bit better than I could. But I think half of it was probably punt coverage. Yep. Um, right. And so uh, and and not. Right, like there were returners, so maybe there's a little bit of insight there. Caden Saunders was back. Yep. Uh, Omari Evans was back, returning punts. I think that's probably significant. Um, but uh, Keandre Lambert Smith, I think, was another one who was back there. That would surprise punts. me. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. It's look like there. There's kind of a reality here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to downplay watching 10 minutes of punt coverage, but. Barney and Moore, right? Like they have Mm -hmm. significant spots to fill in punt return with Jahan Dotson gone and at punter with Jordan Stout gone. Mm -hmm. So like, it's not, it's not nothing. It's, it's something. Um, But yeah, no, half of that time was that. And then the rest of the time, I think we got to see a little bit more of the quarterbacks going to continue in, in the vein of uh, Sean Clifford being one Christian value being two. Bo Prabula being three, and everyone's favorite, Drew Alar at four. Yep. Uh, and so yep. that's that was that. And then running backs, you know, you got to see a little bit of those guys. And, I, you know, look, like, I, I don't think that there's any surprise here. Nick Singleton is relevant. Yeah. He's relevant. <laughs> he, uh, I, so I the the way James Franklin relevant, talked about him, too, yeah. like just the – James Franklin doesn't really rave or glow about people. Now, he will pump guys up, and he will give some even-handed praise, but it was hard for him, I think, to contain how impressed he was physically, especially with both Katron Allen and and especially Nick Singleton from his comments yeah. last night. Yeah, I, I, I get the sense that he's trying to, right? Like, that he's, mm-hmm. that he's trying to temper, uh, y- you know, letting anything get away. Um, or get carried away, I guess, with with how Nick is being perceived. But look, like the 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 corollary or the complement to what we see in practice is what we hear from people after practice. And yesterday it was James Franklin, Mike Yursich, Juice Scruggs on the offensive line, and John Sutherland. And you know, uh, again, like 
nobody's surprised or nobody should be surprised that all of them, whether prompted or not, are talking about Nick Singleton. So, um, you know, I, I, I do think that there is some reason to believe he is falling into the vein of Kalen King last year, right? Yeah. He was kind of the, the star of the spring in terms of uh, a, a young guy who gets to this level and is ready for it. Yeah. Uh, and that's what Nick appears to be. One of the comments, too, about the James Franklin that admitted He's a little, and he said, I'm even embarrassed to admit this, but Zoom is yeah. helping guys that aren't even here. So there are yep. more players that can be a part of the picture as true freshmen because they're meeting with coaches now, uh, now that they're committed in the offseason. And Deny Dennis Sutton's talked about that. Uh, Abdul Carter's talked about that here on the BWI Daily Edition of, you know, getting into the playbook, knowing your assignment, uh, mentally getting. Uh, on the curve that they need to be to play, and then it becomes the physical aspect of it yep. that is the the difference maker. And for guys in this class, there's a lot of there's a lot of them that can contribute early from a physical standpoint. So yep. it is interesting because my view of Carter and Keon Wiley, especially at that linebacker position, was one that they're obvious red shirts. But the more we hear too of guys that even aren't even here. And then you throw in Nick Singleton and what James Franklin said, there are more guys in this class that can contribute early than probably mm -hmm. previous classes. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Like, it's just that just yeah. when you look at the whole picture, that's really interesting. And then and then Nick Singleton specifically stands out from that group. Yeah, the, the only the only caution that I would provide, I, I don't want to be a, a wet blanket here, but if if the COVID experience right pertaining to football mm -hmm. taught me anything it's that it it is just so different trying to teach and train off site from from on right like i mean you just you just have no control uh so right so involving those guys like the the zoom as you just mentioned doing doing those things trying to get those guys up to speed on the playbook concepts all of those different things yeah, I think I think that the, the technology does help. And I think that that, um, you know, certainly the willingness of the player to, to be part of that and be engaged with it while they're still completing high school is yeah. is significant. Like, there's no question about that. And it's something that didn't exist before in the previous model. So having it, it may not be the answer to get everyone as ready as they'd be if they were on campus as an early enrollee, but yeah. it it does change what your previous expectations were when freshmen come in and they definitely have to redshirt unless they're really, really rare specimen. And Penn State's got a little yeah. bit of both in this class. They got a little bit it, of rare specimen and guys that now have this opportunity. It, and, and that's the deal, right? Is yeah. it's, it's yes, physically you have to be ready. Mentally you have to be ready. Those are, those are two significant components, but then there's the third, which is, what what's the need of Penn State proper? Right. What, what is the need of this roster and this defense or offense? And you know those are things that I think that they probably have a feel for. But it's it's a it's a combination of yes, yeah, sometimes players can come in and they're just so good and they're so prepared that they're ready for that moment and that opportunity. And then there's there's the second, which is hey, ready or not we need you like it, it has right. to happen and right. so that's that can be uh you know something that that you know helps out with that as well so something i noticed that was um uh, we hadn't seen previously i was i was not around the quarterbacks which for some reason i keep avoiding the quarterbacks it's because they're in the middle of the field or they're far away and i like what when i'm doing my job there i'm just like i'm not going to get anything good video or photo so I'll go over to where they're closer and I can get a little bit better uh, quality content for our BWI subscribers. But that usually leads me over to the running backs and receivers. And the running backs and receivers were doing a couple of different drills than what we had seen previously. And I liked watching the high point where the they have to they're catching the ball. It's thrown intentionally high, so they've got to go up and get it. Um, Mitch Tinsley and Malik Mega, I think, yep. look great. Um, yep. Uh, Malik Mega especially is a unit. He is everything you want in your X receiver. He's big, physical, just expressive muscles, fast, strong. 
and uh, and he looks really good catching the football in the air. So, uh, you know, the de- the depth and talent at that receiver position seems to be significant. Yeah. Can, uh, you know, look, like, we've had and have been in this place before, and the question is, will continue to be, can he catch the ball <laughs> right? Like, right. Can, consistently? Like that's, right. that's such a big part of it is, is can he get open? I mean, all, all of the physical traits in the world uh, it, create a better opportunity to be successful when that moment comes, but you still have to go out and do it. And I, I you know, look like just talking from 17 years of experience doing this, it, it's literally just about being able to duplicate the effort. And if these guys can go out and catch it every time the ball comes their way, then yeah, you, you really got something there. But th- those two things have to marry before they can uh, take off. Mailbag time because Nate oh, has boy. a perfect transition into one of the questions I wanted to get to today uh, on the BWI Mailbag with Nate and T. Frank because a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is not just our observations from practice, but questions about spring football. And Brian asks, is Malik Mega good or is it all hype train? Choo-choo. Nate, I got a little bit of your opinion here. So just bu- put a button on it for me. Good or yeah. hype train? Good. Good. I, like, I don't want to give the wrong impression. I, I don't think that he's not good. And, and, and frankly, I think that there's been uh, an anticipation for him for, for two years now. Right. Like it, yep. it wasn't, it wasn't as though, um, you know, look like no, nobody existed during that 2020 COVID year. Like that, that, that freshman class, those, those true freshmen just, it, it was uh, a wash or as close to it as you can, can call it. But last year, uh he would have played earlier, right? Like uh, he, he would have been, <laughs> excuse me, he would have been involved earlier uh, had he not had a couple of, of dings that he had to recover from at the beginning of the season. So look, like I, I think that this has been a long time coming, but also one that is grounded in potential. Like the, 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 the excitement about him and the anticipation for him to come in and be able to p- play and produce was not like just a fantasy. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't like you, you know you're hoping on a on a wish and a prayer that because he has these physical attributes that he convert that that he can convert that over to the football field. No, like he's done it. They they've seen that. They've seen that in practice. They've seen that potential. But a- again, it's just a matter of being able to do that in practice and being able to to have the physical traits and then carry those over to a game in front of people, all of those varying factors. That's different. Yeah, <laughs> that's different. You got to do it. And so like, we didn't, we just didn't get the opportunity. I don't think last season to, to really see what he looks like in normal, you know, first string versus first string action. Yeah. Like that just, yeah. That, and, and we're going to find certain- out. We're going to find out. I, we're not going to find out during practice of what you and I get to see on a weekly basis because positional drills don't tell me anything about his route running skills. So is Malik Mega good or is it all hype train? And here's here's the thing. Until I get to see it in person during the blue-white game, it's got to be hype train because when we talk about Malik Mega, the things that he was known for I guess the things that we heard was he's best friends with Parker Washington he's learning and soaking everything up from Parker Washington which means he's learning route running he's learning the game of football coming from Canadian football to American football he's had enough time now that he's those lessons have to be imprinted so this spring we're going to find out if it's hype train or if it's it's legit because the physical skills are absolutely there I have no question about that. He is fast. He is big. He can, you know, do anything you want from that position. The only question is, can he do anything you want from that position? So questions I have, at that size, does he break tackles? At that size, is he good in contested catch situations? Or will he have problems, you know, if there's somebody draped on him when he's trying to catch the football? And then finally, does he break tackles? Does he catch the ball and at 6'4", 6'3", whatever he is, 200 and whatever pounds, does he run fools over? 
because they had a real problem with breaking tackles and getting yards after the catch last season. So can he bring any of those things to the table? And then generally, what is he like as a football player on the field? Because we got to see him in, in basically two games. We got to see him in the Rutgers game with the backup quarterback and everyone else had the flu, and then in a blizzard in Michigan State where he was rather nondescript because... Mm -hmm. You know, how can you run good routes if you're going to fall over if you cut hard? So we're going to see in the spring game. Yeah. I firmly believe I'm going to have a better idea of who Malik Mega is because if he doesn't have those skills at this point, there's a lot of depth and talent at that receiver position. So the time is now for him yep. to make that move. Yeah, no, I, th I mean, look, and 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 it's one thing to emerge. I, I mean, again, like I don't want to sound, uh, I, I don't want to sound as though I'm dampening um, you know, the, the possibility for him or for the receivers, but there's also a difference between breaking out amongst your peers on the team that you're on and then doing it at Purdue, doing it at <laughs> Auburn. Yeah. Like those are, those are significant strides that need to be made, but also that's this level. Like that's, that's college football. It, yeah. This is a story that repeats itself literally every single year. So uh, you know, I think that as I'm sitting here today, March 31st, there is plenty of potential, plenty of possibility for him. Um, and certainly there's optimism within the program uh, about what he can bring to the table for them. He, he needs to. Like, yeah. it has to happen uh, if, if Penn State's offense is going to do any of the things that they want to do this season. So then the question becomes, he has to... Are you saying that Keandre Lambert Smith is not, he just hasn't taken that step, so you don't expect that? Because I guess that's the, that's kind of what I'm looking at, too, is not only the freshman, but at, I would yep. say at a similar position, Keandre Lambert Smith brings a skim, similar skill set um, and has played. We know a little bit more about what he is as a football player, so it, are you just kind of saying they need more than just one guy to step up? <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think I am. I mean, I think that, look, like Mitchell Mitchell Tinsley, I think the expectation right now is that he will play and be very, very productive. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I, I don't think I'm overstating what those no. expectations are. Parker Washington, obviously the same. Look, uh, Kendrick Lambert-Smith has not done it fully yet. And, and I've said this before, I'm literally just echoing what Mike Yersich has said, what Taylor Stubblefield has said. It, it's about consistency. It's about being able to, to go out there and repeat the process and have that success from the practice field to the game. He, he was on the field a ton last year. I know we've talked about that previously, but Keandre Lambert Smith has a ton of reps from last season that he can use to, to, to further himself as, as a player this season. However, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's whether it's him being open, whether it's Sean Clifford looking for him, uh, right? Like what option he is in, in Sean Clifford's reads, he he doesn't have the catches to to back it up, and so uh, somebody has to be a third receiver, right? Whether it's Malik Mega, whether it's Keandre Lambert Smith, whether it's somebody else, whether it's Caden Saunders, like I don't know, but I know that historically, if you look back at how Penn State's offenses have been the most productive, it has demanded at least three very productive receiving threats. And that can include the tight ends as well, but you, you have to have three. Four is preferable, um, and, and that's when yeah. they win. That's it's when they've had their to, best season. It's too easy to take away one option, and, and then if your best receiver has a bad game, what do you do? You know, you can scheme away one player. So if you want, to, for example, if you want to take away Jahan Dotson, then you got Parker Washington. Parker Washington can have an impact, but if you don't have another guy to say, okay, now we're going to make you pay for that, for dedicating resources elsewhere, then you don't have the balance on offense to be a good passing offense. You know, if you want to look at balance inside just the passing game, which I think yep. everyone thinks of balance as just offense run, offense pass, and do you have that? It, there are different ways... We talked about it last season, balance in the running game of you need to be able to break off big runs. You know, ha not having consistency is great, 
but if you can't be explosive, you're not balanced in the run game. So everyone wants perfect balance and everything, but that doesn't really exist. So let's move on to uh, CM CG6420, which sounds like a password. <laughs> not to make fun of somebody's screen name on, uh, on Blue White Illustrated, but coming this spring ball, what are the projected strengths of the team? Weaknesses? He or she, I should say, guesses will be O-line and linebackers. What would you say to the first part, and do you agree with the second part? Oh, um, projected strengths of the team. Well, look, the the passing game wasn't bad last year. It was actually pretty productive. And I think that if you give Mike Yersich a second year with Sean Clifford or whoever wins that quarterback competition i feel like i always have to add that caveat but let's assume for right now that it's going to be sean clifford yeah i mean the offense should be pretty good and i think that the running backs and the offensive line which by the way they dipped their toes into to some optimism last night right like yeah. the people that we spoke to james franklin mike yersich andrew scruggs all signaled that they feel like progress is being made at every level, the tight ends, the offensive line, and the running backs to be able to get that on track. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's it, like it's hard to sit. It's hard to sit here and say like what what are the projected strengths and say the offense. But yeah, I think the offense has the potential to be pretty good this season. Can I? Uh, a, a, can yeah, I? Can I give you a subset of that? I think yeah, the left side of the offensive line can be a strength of the team because I limited sample size or not. I am fairly confident that Landon Tangwell is going to be a good football player next year. Fairly confident is an understatement. I'm excited to watch him play football because I love watching good players play well. And I think he can deliver that next, next fall. We have only heard how special Olaf Ashunu is. We've only heard just how talented he is physically. I'm yep. interested to see what is the break point of how physically talented he is and where all of that stuff lines up? Because I saw good things in the bowl game, but is he yep. going to be able to block the best of the best coming up? Juice Scruggs, we, we talked to him yesterday, made it sound like he's going to be that. And then Juice Scruggs, Scruggs himself, I wrote an article at Blue White Illustrated uh, today about the offensive line and some of the problems on the interior in their run blocking and how he can solve that this year because at the very least, looks like... He passes the eye test. He is big, strong. He looks like he carries it really well. So if you've got yep. three guys left to center that are really good at football and have taken a step physically, mentally, and all of those things, I think even if you have some freshman mistakes from the two at left guard and left tackle, you're going to have higher highs. You're going to have peaks where they are really good. Yeah, and, and look, like, one, protection for Sean Clifford, for sure. Yeah. But also, what did they talk about with, with Singleton? They talked about his burst, yep. right? Like, as soon, when he hits the hole, that's it. He's gone. So, if you've got that combination, and if that's the potential, now, and look, like, maybe that exists for Kevon Lee this offseason. Maybe that exists for Keziah Holmes this offseason. I'm not sure, but it, it certainly seems and would appear as though that running back position has the possibility of having an option there who can take, like, it just, it, I understand how it sounds, but, like, can take advantage of the shots that they get because you're not guaranteed that many opportunities. But when you get it, you got to take advantage. And that was the notion that they hammered home all last season was you, you're not going to get this many chances at this level, right? Yeah. To get into a one-on-one -on -one situation, you got to either run over somebody yeah. or run past them. And they yep. didn't have the, they didn't have the horses to do that last year. Yep. And I think that is a, uh, a really good point. And that might lead us to hold on. Got to find the right question. Wait, we didn't we didn't answer the weaknesses. Oh, we didn't answer the weaknesses. You were doing such a great transition into the next thing I wanted to talk about. But we'll get to that later. Okay. Weaknesses of the team. What do you think? I actually I don't have a great answer for this. I don't know why. I don't know why I brought it back. <laughs> Hold on. We must go yeah. back. 
And yeah, then I don't know. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer this one. I'll, I'll give you something. Go here. ahead. Yeah. I am. I have been and will be concerned about the pass rush. I don't think the defensive line overall will be bad, but the defensive end pass rush, there seems to be a big hole there. And deny Dennis Sutton okay. can be the solution. He can be. And I yeah. would say maybe by the end of the season, he's a big part of the puzzle. But out of the gate, I, I, just, I, I don't know. Because I maybe I don't share the same optimism about some of the young players on the roster that some of the other people do. I got guys I like their profile and their physical abilities. Devon Townley Jr., I think, has some talent. But again, a redshirt freshman, a true freshman, Adisa yeah. Isaac, and, and Smith Vilbert are the guys that are really the pass rushers. I would have to be convinced that Nick Tarburton or Zariah Fisher are going to be forces in that particular situation. I think Amin yeah. Vanover, if he were a third guy or a fourth guy in the rotation, I would I, I would be legitimately thinking this unit can be dangerous. Yeah. But if he's pushed up the depth chart as a, as a tweener, a power and length guy that doesn't have great burst, I... I just I don't know where the sacks are coming from. And if you don't have yeah. that, then a younger secondary that does not have, I think, a potential superstar at the NFL level in Jaquan Brisker, but at the very least a starter in the NFL in Jaquan Brisker and a career starter in college in Tariq Castro Fields, then you leave yourself open to a lot of problems in the secondary with, with that. So, yeah. you know, I think those are tied together. Yeah. But to me, the pass rush is a real problem. Yeah. Uh, I think that there are a lot of chips being banked on Adisa Isaac coming through. I yeah. think that he's had longer time, a longer span of time to, to rehabilitate and get through his injury that he had last year. He suffered it early last summer. So, you know, look, like you, you're talking, you're going to be talking about more than a year for him uh, to, to have recovered. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any so question. He's just so light. He's just, and I know that, like, you can be strong for your size, and I talk about this all the time. And, again, yep. there's an example on the on the roster of Zane Durant being uh, just a, a powerhouse and a, a smaller guy, but at 244 pounds, as a, it's what he's listed at. Yep. That's a concern that he's not going to have the strength to get through contact even if he wins with speed. And I don't think that... So, Shaka Tony was undersized as a defensive end. But he always had Yitor Grossmatos or, or, or Odafe Owe to, to kind of like be a one-two punch there. Where right. he would be able to get some pressures. He would show up in big moments. But then there was somebody else there to help be the Batman Robin or the whatever sort of like duo you want. Yep. If it's just Adisa Isaac, that's a concern. I think I, I've got I've got uh, no, no qualms with that. The, the other thing that I would say, uh, and again, like not that big of a deal, but can be Jake Pinnegar as field goal potentially. Right, that's a good point. Or standard side, like I, I don't know. I, I I would just say that last year, place kicking was more of a problem than they allowed it to seem, based on red. Like everybody loves Jordan Stout. And he had a great career at Penn State, but I, I absolutely think that place kicking was lacking last season. And it's something that they're going to need, right? Like they have to shore that up uh, if they're going to be in as many uh, close games as I would expect them to be this season. Yeah. So two things, too, about um, that's a really great point. Two things. Last things about the pass rush. First off, Manny Diaz known for designing blitzes and having pressure packages so they can work around not having an elite rush with just four unit also Manny Diaz is a little more aggressive with his defensive tackles a little more bringing the heat with a three tech and guys are firing off the ball and getting upfield and I wouldn't say that Penn State wasn't that before where they were um, doing more line stunts I think so maybe they're running and they're exploding laterally to beat by scheme rather than I'm just going to fire up field into my gap and beat you. 
There's a lot more of that with Manny Diaz up front from the from the defensive tackle. So run and pass, that might also factor in where they've got some really, I think, promising three techniques to be able to rush the passer. So let's move on. Uh, of the returning starters from 2021 on Penn State's roster, which players do you think will face the most competition when it comes to retaining that starting position in 22? In other words, what 21 starters are in, lose, are in danger of losing their spot come week one? Hmm. I hmm. I don't know if I would say losing their spot. I would say that maybe Brenton Strange has mm -hmm. some serious competition on his, you know, in terms of like becoming shared starting status. Uh, and not that Theo Johnson wasn't already there. Maybe he was, but you know, in terms of being leapfrogged a little bit, sure, uh, he he would be one that comes to mind. What do you got? I would go with, and this is kind of a leap here. I would go with Kevon Lee. Yeah. Because he's going to go through all the drills as the number one player at his position. Because he's the veteran. He's the known commodity. He is a good football player. And I want to emphasize on the front end, I thought he got better at a lot of things, including being elusive with the ball in his hands in space as a receiver towards the end of the season. I think he's trying to evolve as a football player. Here comes the but. His skill set is limited. It's been limited since he was a freshman. He is not what you just talked about at the beginning of the show. They need yep. to hit home runs. He is not a home run hitter. I don't think that he's going to be able to gain the speed necessary to change that in one off season, especially when he's either bigger or the same size as he was last year. So if there's a guy that has a complete running back profile that can do both be dependable, physical chain mover, which Kevon Lee struggled with last year and can be that home run threat. I'm not saying Kevon Lee isn't a part of the rotation, but I could see maybe not week one, but pretty quickly. Yeah. Somebody else taking the starting reps and he cycles in as the change of pace. I, I was going to say change the question to week five. And then I think there are more options in play. Yeah. So you, you know? don't have to be great at pass protection right away. So this is the thing too, is James Franklin talked about physically the true freshman running backs can handle pass protection and kind of, if you've watched any of my breakdowns on Katron Allen and how mature he is coming from IMG James Franklin not echoed my statements but said the same thing last night about him you don't have to be great at those things to just carry the ball right so if, if you're Nick Singleton and it's the first quarter and you're in on a drive you don't have to be great at pass protection on second and six or second and four you can still hand him the ball at that point yep yeah so yep. Uh, anybody on the defensive side because I think we spent uh, the the obvious Running back, tight end, there are some pretty yeah. clear things there. Anything on the other side of the ball that sticks out to you? I, I just think that the defensive tackle spots were a little bit by default last year after yep. Mustafer got hurt. And so I think they're going to have to figure that out. I Like, I don't know if I'm going to name names, right? Like, I, I don't know if it's if it's at that point. I just think it's that John Scott is going to have to see what he's got at that yeah. position and then and then go forward right because i mean i think that the part of the conversation that we've had is they have some they have some tweeners to to steal from your lexicon there uh that could kind of do both do either and how you know where's pj mustafer going to be right like in yeah. at, at what phase will he be in his recovery by the time that the season starts so i i Definitely think that there are some questions there that are going to need to be sorted out. Yeah, and then in general, I just think that slot position, Jonathan Sutherland is going to be there a lot because he provides you safety-like qualities. So you're not going to substitute into sub-packages as much, I don't think. So I'm not saying Daquan Hardy is going to see the field less because he's absolutely going to see the field on third down. I just, I yeah. can't see them keeping Jonathan Sutherland on the field on third down. But the point of that field safety position is exactly that, to keep 
somebody on the field at all times that has those skills to play in the run, blitz, be aggressive, play the edge of the box, and play in coverage. But Hardy's too uh, too talented as a coverage player for him not to see the field. So I can see that one going a bunch of different ways. So I just want to bring up that new 11th defender position is I'm curious as to how the rep distribution happens there if you also include Jamari Button and yep. and where he fits into that as a more traditional linebacker in body type, even though I think he's roughly around the same size as Sutherland from a weight perspective, at least what we see that's listed. So what's the SWAT player of practice? I understand that the Aces and Lawn Boys for specific positional groups, but what's this new thing, the SWAT team uh, for anybody? Is it just for anybody? Is it special teams? What is it? Uh, that's a great question that I don't feel, uh, prepared to answer because <laughs> I really, I I've seen it. I've seen the logo and the graphics yeah. and you know, good job Penn state in-house graphics team. But yep. I, I don't, I don't think that I've ever actually seen the, uh, the acronym, right? Like I don't, I don't I, so it caught me off guard. I did a little bit of digging on this. Um, now SWAT stands for special weapons and tactics. So this gotcha. is this this special and the fact that it's coming I believe I read with from Stacy Collins makes this seem like this is a special teams sort of role. But Malik Mega won it and I I don't know if he's on special teams. I don't know if he's a gunner he's a, on he's, special teams. He's a gunner, dude. So it could I be. told you, gunner. He, yeah. He was Drew Hartlob's pick for gunner to replace him well there you go there's your first malik mega is a is a freakazoid sort of position for him to be is that he's going to be the gunner because he's bigger and faster and can hit harder than anybody on the roster and that's what you want from a gunner am i am i misremembering Jawan johnson filling a similar role i don't remember i've i've somebody asked me if that was a good comp for malik mega and i said that Malik is much faster, like much, much faster. Also, just from a narrative standpoint, we knew what Juwan was much earlier in his career. I still think it's a wild unknown as to what the personality type of Malik Mega's game is. Is he just a straight line athlete? Is he just a deep ball receiver? Is he a guy that has to catch and run? What is he? Yeah. I'm going to find out in the blue white game. It, like we're going to get an put, idea, but that not until then. Put it this way, there there have been Penn State has utilized receivers in that role in the past. It yeah. hasn't just been like cornerbacks or safeties who yep. have filled the gunner spot. So for what it's worth. Uh let's move on to my guy <laughs> Beaver Man. Non sequitur. <laughs> yeah, no, I just I just dropped it and moved on because I didn't know how to I didn't know how to smoothly do that. So we'll just hard cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beaverman72, my guy on Twitter. 2016 halftime against Minnesota was probably the hottest James Franklin's seat has been. I don't necessarily think his seat should be hot, but is there any different sense of urgency pressure than the last couple of years? How important is this season to the perception of the program? So he got close there. Mm -hmm. He got close there. And, 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 and Beaverman, I hear you. You wanted to say is James Franklin on the hot seat, but you knew who you were talking to and you knew that we're not going to answer sort of questions that way. So I appreciate how you switched up that question and how you kind of brought it back to more of a reasonable thing for us to say in March. So I think it's a fair question, though. I think he's got a yeah. very fair question of the perception of the program after two seasons below 500. Um how do at you 500 at five? Uh, sorry, at 500, but you know, like we're I'm making below, people mad <laughs> below expectation, much I would say far below expectation. So, what is the pressure on this season knowing you're returning a lot of same pieces of the puzzle that led to the last two seasons? Yeah, I, I struggle with this question, uh, because you know, look, it's this isn't uncommon. This isn't something that we don't hear a lot. And my, my answer is if you're not a psycho every day <laughs> of your life, right? Every day of your life, 365 uh -huh. days a year, then you haven't gotten to that position in the first place. There is not a college football coach at this level, whether he's won the national championship last year or not, 
who isn't a complete nutcase. And right. like if Completely you're not motivated, unbalanced as a person, right? If you don't like if you don't if you don't think that Nick Saban comes to work every day concerned with how he's going to win another national championship and all of the thi- and like feel that pressure and feel it's just a question of of where the pressure is coming from because right. the answer that you're going to get from these guys a lot of the times is there there can't be like what difference does it make? I mean, I, I hate to minimize in any way what the role of fans is, but that's the truth. Is it doesn't matter what the media says, and it doesn't matter what fans say. If James Franklin and his other coaches on the staff aren't feeling an internal pressure that outweighs that of everything else externally, then they're not doing their jobs, and right. they're not doing they're not you know fitting into what the MO has been throughout their careers. And that's not just them. That's literally everywhere. That's Jim Harbaugh. That is Ryan day. That is across the board. That is how these guys operate. Yeah. And I I have not ever seen any difference in that from him over more than eight years now. Yeah. So on a personal level with James Franklin, I think that's a very fair statement. Also given the fact that he's a brand new contract. So this is, this is, I think this is kind of how I'd look at it. There is no owner to make a knee-jerk reaction here. So if you were the owner of an NFL team and you do listen to the radio and there is ego involved of my coach is terrible and everybody says it and I'm embarrassed personally and I have the power to do whatever I want because I'm a billionaire and I don't care if I have to pay him to go away. I'll pay a couple million dollars for my hubris. Penn State is a business run by a committee and a president, and there are multiple levels of checks and balances, whatever you want to call it, administrative things between fan and coach pressure, where you just need a really loud radio, print, fan, Twitter experience for some of these NFL teams run by weak owners that make poor decisions to make that happen. So the same mechanism does not exist at this level for the most part. And I'll say that for the most part, there are some universities that have big influential donors that can lean on things and make things happen. I'm looking at you, Tennessee, for all the stuff you've done to Texas, Texas to throw yourself back every single time you take a step forward. Penn state clearly does not have that. So from the personal pressure, there is no pressure on James Franklin there may be on some of his assistants if he does not get what he wants out of them. Sure. Where those guys might feel the pressure from James Franklin, but not from the media or the fans. The yeah. part that I think is important that he brings up, and I'll, I'll put this up here again because this is the the part that I think is important. How important is this season for the perception of the program? Because that then goes to recruiting and whether or not you're cool. Can Penn State weather another season of being bad and still be cool? Yeah, but what's bad? So, yeah, but that's then that is to me. Now we're at the crux of the conversation. What is bad? What is they are not attractive enough to keep themselves recruiting at a top 10 level? to continue the flow of talent, to replenish the stock so they don't have a dip, which led to some of the down years because they 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 missed on some offensive linemen, they missed on some positions through recruiting, and then you see the fruits of it a couple years later. So what is the cool line for high school athletes? Uh, you know, I don't think you can go seven and six again without some sort of damage to your brand with with student athletes and i'm talking very broadly very yeah. broadly because every individual because we can get to this conversation of nuts and bolts of recruiting is all personal it's individual but i'm saying as a whole all the games matter all the things matter all the little incremental steps they all matter and if one of the big ones is winning and losing and if you've lost for three seasons straight i do think that damages your reputation i don't think it's the death knell i don't think it's the end of it but I do think you can see a trend go the other way unless you're just that good at recruiting. Yeah, but but he is 
that good at recruiting. They are that good at recruiting. Their, yes. their most successful years recruiting have come after and in the wake of not great seasons. Right. <laughs> right. Like two, 2016 doesn't happen. I mean, first of all, 2016 was a year early, right? Yep. 2017 yep, yep, yep. even doesn't happen if they don't recruit well coming off of not great records. Yep. Like they finished one game above 500 in 2015 and 2014. Yep. So they excel at being able to get high school student athletes and their parents and the people around them to share in the vision. Mm -hmm. That That is it, is share the vision, connect on an interpersonal level, and then build and grow from there. That is what they do. They are excellent at it. It doesn't matter if they've had tremendous success or bad lows, that they are very, very effective as a staff at being able to do that, and James Franklin in particular. So I, I don't... I don't see, I mean, first of all, I don't, I don't think that they're going to go 500 this year, but I, I also don't think that three is that different from two, right? Or that two is that different from one in terms of stringing unsuccessful, right? By Penn yeah. State standards, unsuccessful seasons together. Well, three would be unprecedented. I guess that's the point with James Franklin. And it's funny because it's been eight years, but eight years is not, if you're considering one year as a sample size, so you only have eight of them. And so I was doing an article on, uh, on James Franklin, the center, what they kind of want from that position. And originally my thought was they've wanted smaller guys, quicker, more athletic linemen there, but really it's just Michael Mennett played there for three of the eight years we've seen. So, and then the other one was, yeah. was Mike Miranda and those guys are undersized. So almost yep. half the time, was one player. So you can't really like it is still kind of a gray area there. But I will agree. I will agree. I don't think that's why I kind of hedged when I said seven and another seven and six season is a is a cataclysm. I don't think it is, but it, we may begin to see an erosion of that success instead of a building of that success that they've had on the recruiting trail. It, I, I think that the problem that that James Franklin has is one of this being such a there's a, such a newness to the program as it is i, I was commenting to uh, a, a person that i know at penn state yesterday at practice like there are so many new faces that if right. you look across the pro if you're watching looking at the field <laughs> right players yes but coaches in in big positions stacy collins you know in a big position uh Brent Pry not being there, Manny yep. Diaz, right? Like yep. those are those are big shoes to fill. And not just that, but the way that James Franklin runs the program, he relies so much on his inner circle uh of of high level staffers. And you've got a bunch of new faces there too. Yeah. So I, I it's just it's just a it's just a it's an interesting moment because it doesn't feel like last year was building necessarily toward a breakout this season. It feels like this season is what you need to build towards a breakout next season. Right. And at that point, wh where is the perception? Because the, the, the truth here is it does not matter what Penn state internally thinks about the 2020 season. It doesn't yep. like COVID all of those things are irrelevant to the larger conversation that's being had among fans. So I, you know, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't see pressure as being like, it's going to be a buzzword, but it shouldn't. Oh but yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. But also, yeah. Like the, the, there is no question that for James Franklin, for Penn state football to have the type of success that it wants to have now, not later, but now serious, serious improvements need to happen on the field this season. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's it's a fair the the number that keeps coming into my head, so I'll just say it out loud is eight and four. I think an eight and four season, there's no that is a that starts the threshold of that's a good season for this particular team. And whether fans want to yeah. hear that or not, I, I think that's a reality of it's a, it's built what you just said. Building on what happened last season, improvement over that, but if you get more of the same, maybe it just holds water, but I I just I, I think that you just can't and I agree with you about 2020. You and I have had this conversation. There's no point in rehashing how much we consider that to be an outlier. But the point is perception. 
And I'm not talking about, again, I'm not talking about perception with fans. I'm talking about perception with either high-level recruits or guys they want to get in the program that might want to go to another school. And if you've got three seasons of not being great, high school kids don't have enough memories to have a long memory. <laughs> like, they are forming their brain as you're talking to them. So if their only existence is Penn State being sub-500 and, like, 15 to 18, very impressionable time. I'm just saying I can see the seeds of that being sown with another subpar season. Now, they're still capable of coming out of that, but, you know, now we're, through. as I said before, we are now speculating upon the speculation. We are now three yeah, right. speculations and 18 months deep, which at that point is no longer in the reality of what's reasonable to speculate about. MJ Breer is uh, excited for the Bauer Hour here on Twitter. He says, who's the under radar, under the radar player who is potential, who has the potential to have a breakout season? And it's not my reading skills, Nate. It is not my T reading Frank. skills. T Frank, uh, this this plays into this a little bit, but I want to I want to go a hundred percent under the rabbit hole here with you okay. on this hypothetical. All right, what if? What if, what if they lose, uh, let's say, let's say they start two and three. Okay. okay. And a certain true freshman quarterback takes over and they win, uh, they, they win all but two of their remaining games. Right. So let's let's they, call they, it what it is. Uh, Purdue, Ohio, Auburn, Central Michigan, Northwestern. So they lose all the Power Five games, and they beat Ohio yeah. and Central Michigan. And then you're saying they win all of the following games. Michigan, Minnesota, uh, Ohio State, Indiana, Maryland, Rutgers, Michigan State. Okay, I'm saying that they lose the Ohio State game there. Right, right? But, finish right. Eight, but finish eight and four. Mm -hmm. Are people thrilled about the comeback, or are people disappointed that it's another eight-win season? or another less than right like it yeah it just feels it just feels to me like the final number isn't what people it, it is what people react to yeah but the story along the way and how you got there can oh yeah just as much dictate how people perceive your successes or failures if there are young players who can start to show the seeds of development and start to show a, a future for for the program then maybe that changes right what yeah. what is contextual because look <laughs> you're you're also talking about a program that was thrilled in 2012 with and obviously under dramatically different circumstances yeah. but was thrilled with an 8-4 season yep listen right? Nate like, you're you're talking to the right guy i spent 20 years believing that next year was our year I spent 20 years of my life building an internal optimism that could not be shaken until it was utterly shattered by week eight. And then you're looking for any crumb of hope and yes. also the draft and also the draft, mostly the draft, but there's your crumb of hope. So yes, if you gave them a certain freshman quarterback, which leaves three options to play that way, then absolutely the narrative. And again, what have you done for me lately? will always win out over, I'd say, the um, box score look at the season. Where you go back in time and you look at the 19 blankety-blank season and they were blank and blank. And it's like, oh, well, that's just an average season. And then the next year, and then you listen to historians and they say, they really built that team in the year before where they, they came back and they won all these games and they showed their toughness and they showed their medal. And there you go. Then you got your narrative built. So, yeah. I think I'm, you're absolutely right. I feel I feel guilty though now because there's no reason to think that Sean Clifford won't have a a, a decent to good season, right? <laughs> right, like and and be healthy and oh, have he, success. He is the middle tier NFL quarterback, the nightmare of every team that wants an elite one. Of he's going to be good enough to win you a lot of games, but do you trust him to win the biggest game? Um, and that. That keeps you away from the first overall draft pick. And I'm sorry, I've I I'm I've got some PTSD about this, so I've got to lapse into Bill's talk the whole time. Is that your under the right air player for a breakout season, Nate? Is that who you're going no. with? Okay. No. Because hmm. I'm going with Jalen Reed. Yeah, let's let's hear it. I want I want to hear your your answer first. So Jalen Reed is in a position that he can take advantage of uh being around the football. 
in this defense. And the one thing I saw from his profile that needed to get better this offseason, he needed to be more physical, he needed to be stronger, and reports are he's done that. He looks like he's done that as well. So, reasonable to assume he is a freshman that got experience last year, got a full game under his belt in the bowl game. He's getting all the reps or most of the reps now as the starting boundary safety, I'd imagine. And he's in a defense with a team that is going to emphasize those things. So to me, it feels like there is a strong chance that Jalen Reed can be a breakout player. I don't know that he's under the radar. He's just yeah. young. So that'd be the guy. Yeah. And then the other guy might be Johnny Dixon of, you know, a, a quality yep. player that has a quality season. And then you, you remember him fondly. Yeah. But, you know, something like that. Can, you? can, can Malik mega be under the radar? Would he, would he qualify or is the buzz too? Yeah. The, too the hype, right the now? hype train has too much coal in the fire. I would say mm. under the radar would be like Liam Clifford or, or okay. Harrison Wallace even. Where there's been a lot of hype around Harrison Wallace, but you know what? We're 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 wasting our time here. Jordan Vandenberg. Where <laughs> it's been enough episodes that we can talk about Jordan Vandenberg again. You're right. Yeah, but You're he's right. he's he's the under the radar. No one's expecting it. I yep. think there's ample evidence to believe that he will be a significant part of the rotation there at defensive tackle this season and i think he'll do well so yep. yeah i'll go i'll go with that as my pick all right come come back to me in december when i'm totally wrong so the only thing i would say about that particular position is that you've got a lot of names at that position so you've sure. got and, but that leads to the under the radar part and as i've said multiple times i think he could moonlight as a one tech if he needed to his best opportunity probably is going to be at that three tech to be a penetrator quickness uses hands uses burst but you've got <laughs> Akeem Beeman, you got Zane Durant, Kaziah Izzard's going to have something to say about that. So you got four three techniques deep yep. there. So then it becomes, is there uh opportunity for him to eat over there with Devon Ellis and Cole Brevard? And whenever PJ Mustafer comes back, his duality could serve him either way. So we're, we'll see about that. I also, I also think that, well, two, right? One, the one tech, precludes you from having a breakout because there's no stats, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. So well, it, doesn't, no, so, it doesn't matter. So I'll, I'll disagree with that. The one tech usually stays on the field in third down situations because okay. you substitute, unless you've got a good one, Penn State has thrown Yitor Gross Matos in at three technique before, and then you've got three defensive ends, and then your nose tackle to make sure it's not a screen, essentially, like the guy that holds the line of scrimmage. So if he's in there, as the pass rushing unit, maybe we'll have to see how they play that. I want to, I want to change my answer. Okay. Unnamed Mike linebacker. <laughs> yeah. Under the radar for sure. Yeah. Breakthrough for sure. Yeah. Stats galore. Always at that position. They're going to have a ton of tackles, whoever it is. Sure. Breakthrough. And I am going to change my answer to Jordan Vandenberg. I just Jedi mind tricked oh, my answer. Oh, man. <laughs> Last question today here on the BWI Mailbag Show. Way too early running back rotation? With any surprises? You you want to you want to go through this? Uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 real I and I think that everyone knows this. It's a it's a matter of how how all in do I want to be on Nick Singleton right this season? And I think that the answer is pretty all in, which isn't all all in, but it's close. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think I think that what I saw yesterday and what I think will happen by preseason camp is probably Kevon one, Kaziah two, Nick three. And then you see how it goes. Yeah. Then you see how it goes. Maybe, maybe like, I don't, I mean, tell me if I'm an idiot here, but like Nick returning kickoffs potentially. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, yes. I, I think that that's a great place to put him because that is a natural progression of all the other five-star running backs they've had. It's you need more tackle breaking and straight line explosive speed at that kick return position, as opposed to a punt returner, which is more elusiveness in a short area. So Nick Singleton with a full head of speed as a kick returner makes a ton of sense. And that's a yep. way to get the ball in his hands. 
I mean, Barkley and Miles Sanders both did that. They tried to do that with Ricky Slade and Journey Brown as well. Brown had more success than Slade, obviously. So, yeah, that's been a consistent thing with five-star running backs at Penn State. So, yeah. I mean, it, but but works his way into the conversation. And, you know, whether that finishes as 1A, 1B, or flat out one, two, three, or he's three. I, you know, I'm not exactly sure yeah. right now, but yeah, way too early prediction is sure. Yeah, he'll he'll absolutely be part of that conversation. So I I would give the exact same running back rotation. I'm just still, again, eternal optimist. You want Isaiah, right? I see the talent, man, and I know that Nick Singleton probably has comparable if not more talent. But why would you pass up one guy who's really good for another guy who's better but younger? Like, is the difference between true freshman Nick Singleton and redshirt sophomore, I think at this point? Because I Holmes, like three years yep. older. Yep. He's been through the ringers, been through your program. He knows the offense. He's explosive. And I think he breaks tackles well. I think he's got a shiftiness and a, a power through contact that can be what Penn State needs. So I just want to see it first. Like, I want to see him do it again in the blue-white game, and then we'll never get to see it in practice because of the way practice is set up. But, like, at some point, I got to see him run the ball again before I completely secede things to Nick Singleton because that's I, I just see – more that's there. Fair. And that, that's kind of what I'm talking about with Kevon Lee is I separate them by skill set in my mind. Kevon Lee, Katron Allen, they provide a certain role. Nick Singleton and Keziah Holmes provide a very valuable role. And if you've got two explosive tackle breakers that can take the ball the distance, I want those guys on the field more than the dependable physical run through people guys. That's just yeah. that, you know, that's me. That's, that's what I want out of my offense. You, you're also forgetting the most important part to a sports writer, which is he's hungry <laughs> and motivated. Oh, I don't know what to do with any. Of... Yeah. The intangibles, right? There's all, like, there has to be a story. There's a backstory. He spent the season waiting his turn sure and now sure. arrived so those things i ah those things are absolutely a part of the story but if you this is what i was come back to if you weren't internally motivated to begin with the sure. extra motivation is is temporary so i'm not then then i want to i want to disclude you anyway now if you have a trying moment in your life and i think we've all gone through adversity and you can either grow or you can shrink from that so sure those personal things happen but point those out to me on the football field please where you see i see a guy who can run a 4 4 1 and break tackles and somebody tells me toughness and i'm like 441 is the answer here. So that'll do it today for the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Nate Bauer with us as always. Don't forget, subscribe to Blue Eyed Illustrated on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. We will be back tomorrow, wrapping up the week on Friday.